So I know Mary has been doing all the intros so far this afternoon, but I really wanted to jump in here to introduce our next speaker because he, he's my teammate and I work with him every day. Joe Petrosky is a lead threat hunter in Target Cyber Fusion Center. So like hunting at Target is really a team sport. So not only is he doing the analysis himself, but he's usually also mentoring other Fusion Center folks to uh, help them understand what it is we do and why. I know most of you have never met Joe, but let me tell you, I would not want to be a bad guy on a network that he's hunting in because he, he is just, he is persistent for sure. Uh, Joe's talk today harkens all the way back to our first session, David Holzer's keynote, because David uh, talked about using Fourier transforms to convert time-based data into frequency domain to look for potential command and control beacons. Joe has been trialing this technique at work for a while, and uh, he's here today to tell us all about it. So welcome, Joe. Also, did I do a good enough job talking you up? And do you need my Venmo? Uh, that was great. And yes, thank you very much. <laughs> OK, um, well, if uh, thank you, David, so much for that amazing introduction. And I'll get started. Uh, so uh, I'm Joe, as David uh, did such a great job introducing me. Thank you so much. I got uh, a cyber threat hunter at Target. And today I'm gonna be talking about uh, kind of some interesting ways of finding new bad things that uh, have to do with periodic beacon activity with some Fourier transform mathematics. Um, so a quick kickoff of what I'll be talking about today. So I'll introduce myself really quick. Um, and then I'll talk about what it is we're looking for and what that might possibly look like. Um, I'll do a quick explanation of what I mean by when I talk about time domain analysis versus frequency domain analysis. And then we'll show how to actually use that uh, practically to find signal or bad things in all the noise and background that we'll be uh, trying to find this stuff in. So here's me, uh, work for Target. I got a cool job. Uh, one of the coolest parts about it is I get to roll with David Bianco every day and we get to do all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota with my wife and three dogs. Uh, we have a semi famous piece of public art called the Spoon Bridge and Cherry. And if you stand a little ways away from it, you can get a forced perspective selfie where it looks like you're eating a cherry. Um, so that's what I've been up to. That's me. Um, one of the cool parts about my job is that we have a lot of opportunities to use a little art, a little science, a little creativity, and come up with new and interesting ways of finding solutions and solving problems and finding stuff that wouldn't have been found by other mechanisms. And this is one way of doing that. So I, I'm going to do basically the opposite of what a salesperson is going to do right now. So first of all, I'm not going to sell anything. Um, the code I'll be using, uh, I've posted on our hallway, and you can hit me up later via email or, or on LinkedIn or something like that. I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, we've had problems like open sourcing notebooks and stuff in the past. So like, just reach out to me directly if you want to code. I can share it with you. Um, and I'm not going to promise you that this is going to work. So I'm not going to do anything with AI or machine learning. I'm not going to tell you that what I'm about to do here is going to solve all your problems. I'm not. So instead, what I'm going to do is say, like, this is an interesting technique. So what this will do for you, like, I don't know about you, but I want every dirty trick in the book when I'm looking for bad stuff in my, my environment. And this is another tool for you to use. This is another arrow for your quiver. OK, so first of all, I guess I should start with why we should care about this. Well, the, the state of affairs you know, in the year 2021 of the common era looks a little something like, uh, well, an infection event happens, and a tool, an adversary tool such as Cobalt Strike gets deployed, and eventually that grows up and becomes ransomware. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if you're charged for defending your enterprise, you should be thinking about stuff like this. So what are we actually going to be looking for here? OK, let's talk about this a bit. So we're talking about adversary tools that do things on the network on some sort of periodic basis, uh, you know, maybe not quite metronomic, but on a regular period of activity. Um, and why is that? Because things that aren't directly interactive have to call back to their C2 frameworks periodically. So there are some realistic timeout periods that happen with some of these tools, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. But there'll be some sort of continuous network callbacks or activity from the infected uh, endpoints or wherever that will call back to the adversary C2. And this is what we're going to be looking for and try to interdict this. So an example, if you were to observe some of these things in a packet capture, you might see something that looks a little bit like this. 
So this is a, a get request to a PHP file with some sort of unholy query string on the end of it. And you get a 200 response, whatever. So obviously this isn't the only thing you need to look for. Malleable C2 profiles make this available to look like really whatever you want it to make. So there's no really good way of fingerprinting one particular kind of beacon. And if you've ever looked at any kind of HTTP based data um, at all, you'll know that it's really hard to find. So let me step back a, a sec here and, and kind of explain a little bit about where all this, this crazy idea came from in the first place. So I took the uh, David Holzer's data science for applied data science for cybersecurity course. And it's, if you get the chance to do that, I would strongly, strongly recommend doing it. It's a great course. It's like a big knowledge left hook right to your brain. And I loved it. I'm a math nerd at heart. And one of the things we talked about, there was a section on gathering NetFlow data and applying a Fourier analysis to it to try to find periodic things in it. And this was like, that made my eyes like snap open and the clouds parted. I heard the Messiah chorus. I was like, I, okay, I need to go off and do this. I got to try this. And I thought about it like, well, okay, what can I do to take it a little further? You know, how can I really use this in my own world? And I thought like, okay, do it. NetFlow is cool, but you know, what's the state of what beacons really run on these days? Well, probably HTTP. So why not try to apply this to HTTP data? So that's kind of where this all came from. And if you look at just a count of things that happen over time in the world of HTTP, you get stuff like this. It's a lot of stuff. There's really no great way to sift through this, at least by eyeball. So we're going to need a little bit more to work with. So what's our goal going to be to do all this stuff here? So what we're going to do is take a bunch of HTTP data from across your environment, from some corner of it or whatever, and you're going to find an awful lot of it. So that data by itself is not going to be manageable for you know, a human to go read through and go try to make sense of it. Instead, what we're going to try to do is take that large body of HTTP data and try to reduce it down to something that's much, much smaller and much more reasonable to work with. So we're probably not necessarily going to be building static detection out of this. So in other words, like we're not going to be able to take this thing and like make rules out of it and like send those alerts to your incident response people and stuff like that. Instead, this is going to be an attempt to find or to reduce a large amount of data into something that if there is something bad to be found with this technique, it's going to live in the smaller piece rather than the larger corpus of data. So what are we going to need to do all this thing? Uh, the reason I picked this particular stuff is two reasons. One, it's all super easy to work with and free. So you'll hear me say that a lot. This stuff is easy to use. I didn't pay any money for it. So that's my favorite kind of stuff. So Jupyter Notebook is how I've uh, done all the analysis in this. If you're not using this tool, it's fantastic. I, Jupyter Notebook is life for threat hunters. Um, especially if you're like me, you're not a great coder and you have to go back and change stuff a lot. Jupyter just makes it super easy to do that. Um, once you have that data and uh, you have your Jupyter Analysis Notebook stuff to go work with, you're going to need some stuff to go chew that data. So I'm personally using the Anaconda Python distribution for Windows, but you can use anything that includes NumPy and you will need the FFT or Fast Fourier Transform module from NumPy to do this stuff. So just go pip install that and off you go. Um, you'll need some sort of visualization engine. So in my case, I was using Plotly Express. Again, why it's free and easy, so that's why I did it. You can use any visualization engine you feel like though. So if you're more comfortable with something else, by all means, go ahead and use that. And then you're gonna need the stuff to go chew on. So lots and lots of HTTP logs. In my case, I was using bro slash Zeek HTTP, but you could theoretically use any kind of network log that has a timestamp on it. So feel free to try this with other stuff. Uh, I think the, the most bang for the buck is gonna be doing it with HTTP logs, but go nuts and try stuff. Okay. So how are we going to collect this thing, first of all? So what we're going to be looking for here is outbound HTTP stuff. In this case, I was specifically looking only at GET requests from some segment of your network. So don't do it all. And I'll explain why in a little bit here. But just pick where you're starting from and start there and start small. And a little bit of like pseudo elastic search to go get that would be looking for HTTP stuff originating from inside and it's outbound and works. It's a GET request with 200 status. And the data you want to get back or the column names you want to get back from that can include a lot of stuff, but at least get the timestamp, the URL that was requested, and the source or where it came from. That's what's going to be most important to go to. Okay. And like I said, this is going to be an awful lot of stuff. So we're going to need to whittle this down. Take this corpus of data once you got it back and start excluding known good stuff. Um, 
So, you know, you'll see a lot of things in there that are like, yeah, okay, I know what that is. No, I don't care about that. That's not evil. Yes, this happens all the time. Start excluding all that. Start doing some reductive stuff on your initial data set. This is going to help you out in the long run. And also do it over like a manageable time frame. So don't go off and get months worth of data here. Try it. You might even start with hours. And even that's going to be a lot. But that's going to be enough at least to get you going. Okay. When we're starting to visualize what this data looks like, um, we in the world of cybersecurity are most used to thinking of stuff kind of like this in the time domain. So things happen over time and you can count the things that happen over time. And if you graph these things together, usually we just kind of automatically say, well, the y-axis is things that happen over time and, and for the x-axis is the thing that happens over time. And the y is the count or intensity or something like that. And if you do incident response, uh, this is just ingrained in us. Timelining is just such a critical skill that we just like automatically think of that because then we can establish things like causality or at least strong correlation. We can say that these things happen sequentially in time. So this is really easy second nature type of stuff to us. We need to kind of flip our thinking a little bit. So an electrical engineer would actually see things more like this. So if you ever used a frequency anal analyzer or something like a hack RF or something like that, what you're looking at now is a graph of frequencies. So these are the frequencies present in the spectrum that you're analyzing. And the y-axis is now the amplitude of that signal or its strength. So this is kind of fun if you ever get a chance to try something like this. Say you did this in, oh, I don't know, like the, the FM radio spectrum. What you'll see here is signal spikes that correspond to the tuning frequencies of all the radio stations in your local area. And by you know, weaseling in on the signal here, this is really how FM radio works. You modulate a carrier frequency with your favorite song on the radio. And then when you tune your radio to that frequency, it demodulates the signal and you get your favorite song back. So this is how you can literally see what a radio station looks like. Pretty cool. So usually when we think of stuff in the frequency domain, we're, we're usually talking about stuff in, in the electromagnetic spectrum. So visible light, audible sound or Wi-Fi signal or something like that, right? But you can apply this to really anything that happens on a recurring periodic basis, even if it's not dozens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of things per second. So quick frequency primer here. This is, you know, back to your ninth grade physics, what all this stuff means. So frequency is defined as the number of times that something happens over some length of time. The standard measure of time for this is a second. The unit measure that is a, is a hertz. So one cycle per second is one hertz. And the period or cycle is the inverse of that. So that's the length of time between the times that that thing happens. So that's what it looks like when you kind of graph this in the time domain. So we'll be talking about these kind of things a little bit here. So here's kind of a practical example. If you uh, plug a guitar into an oscilloscope and feed that through a guitar fuzz pedal, you're going to get something like this. So normally you would get this nice sinusoidal wave type thing by applying a fuzz that cuts off the peaks and valleys of that signal and basically converts the signal to a square wave and it looks a little something, something like this. So, cool. Okay, so why do we care? What does this all mean for us back in the world of cybersecurity here? So, well, what we're talking about here is when you start talking about malware that periodically calls back to its C2, that, that's a periodic activity, right? That's what beaconing really means. So if we can take the observable time domain data, so the, the counts of things that happen over time, and convert that into frequency domain, we might be able to see strong signals that are worth looking at. So here's how this all works for us. Um, my boy, Joe Fourier, back in the year 1822, actually came up with this. And what he discovered is that you can take any periodic waveform and you can de decompose it into its component frequencies. What does that mean? It looks a little something like this. So the Fourier transform is the way you do this. This is the mathematical relationship that will take your time domain data and flip it into the frequency domain so you can identify the strength of signal per frequency present in that signal. So what does that mean for us? Well, if you can look at your time domain HTTP data and find strong periodic signals in it, that could be something that's consistent with beaconing activity. And that's what we're trying to do here. So here's a quick example. Uh, so you can, like I said, you can decompose any continuous signal into its component frequencies. So that composite sinusoidal wave there, complex waveform on the left, is actually composed of the three signals on the right. So if you add those things back up together by frequency of ordinates, you will get the signal on the left. And if you decompose the signal on the left, you will get those three things on the right. And you can do this back and forth as many times as you wish. You'll always get the same result. And then once you have these component frequencies of stuff on the right, you can measure the strength of each of those relative to each other. And this is how you can find things that are stronger signals 
present in your original signal. So you wanna know how to do this? Sure, go ahead. Here's the math to go do that. Uh, so this is both the forward and inverse Fourier transform equations. So have all kinds of fun with this. I don't know about you, but I would rather just have Python do this for me. So the, the Python uh, numpy.fft module is literally just to do that is, is for the fast Fourier transform. And it's also it's inverse the inverse fast Fourier transform. Uh, if you go off to NumPy's good documentation, you'll find all the, the various ways of doing this. They got good stuff. This will pretty much talk you right through it. So let's start by doing this with our collected HTTP data. So to do this, what we're going to need to do is actually sample our data, which means that we're going to have to take chunks of time, discrete chunks of time, and measure the signal at each uh, chunks of time. So the sample period is the length of time over which we're going to do that. And the sample frequency is the inverse of that, or is how many times we're going to sample our data over that chosen length of time. And to do this, what we're going to do is pick different sampling periods. So there is a limit as to how infrequent you can sample this data and still get an adequate representation of the original signal. So if you undersample your data, you're going to get uh, an incomplete or, or inaccurate or, uh, representation of what the original data looked like. That would be that bottom curve down there. If you sample it enough, you'll get a much more tight, uh, a much higher fidelity representation of your original signal. And that's what we're going to do here. But by changing the sampling rate, that's almost like going to be sort of like tuning an old AM car stereo, right? Or, or an old analog car stereo, where you kind of twiddle with the knobs a little bit until you get the signal just right. So we're going to do that. So the functions that you're going to use here, and, and again, if you want to follow along my code, that's, you, know, you certainly can, or I can talk about it later. But long story short, there's two frequent or two functions that you're going to want to use. One is the RFT freak function, which returns the frequencies present in the signal, the original signal, or the original data that was supplied. And the other one is the RFFT, or real mode fast Fourier transform function, which takes the original data and returns the strength of each signal found. These, the cardinality of these two sets are the same, and there is a one-to-one -one mapping between them, which means you can graph them against one each other. And that's what we're about to do right now. So here's what we're going to do. Get yourself a bunch of HTTP data to go work with, Resample it at various sampling periods. Tune that that radio by you know that analog radio as much as you can, and see what you can zero in here for strong signals. And each sampling period, we'll apply a Fourier transform analysis and see if there are any strong signals that jump out. So to do that, you can use Python's resample function to group your data, your timestamp data, by whatever kind of sampling period you want. So Python is smart enough to recognize timestamps. Use UTC timestamps and you're good to go. It'll be able to say, you can tell Python to sample it at 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you want, and it will adequately group that data for you. Then you use the FFT function and the FFT RFT freak function to return both the frequencies present and the, the relative signal strengths for each frequency present. And then just graph them in a line graph and see what you get. So, there are some interesting frequencies that might jump out for you as things that are really kind of interesting. So practically, there's sort of a, an upper and lower bounds on, on how often real malware will call back to its C2. So you know, by doing it real too often, like a, something that calls back every second is gonna be far too noisy and will probably be identified and detected by other methods. So a, a real adversary would probably wanna be a bit more stealthy than that. On the other hand, if your beacon interval is far too long, that means that's the maximum length of time <clears throat> between commands that can be issued. That's super, super frustrating for an adversary, right? So they want to have a reasonable timeout period that they can issue between cycles. So for example, if you see frequencies in your Fourier analysis that correspond to about you know, 1 0.0167 hertz, that is one cycle every 60 seconds, or so, uh, or the, the hertz for it is, is uh, the hertz for for that would be 60 over one, right? So that's what that, that corresponds to. So if you see a frequency of that, that means you're roughly looking at something that happens once a minute or half of that would be once something that happens once every two minutes, et cetera. So these are some interesting frequencies that you might possibly look for. That, that last one should be 0 0.0017 Hertz. Okay, so enough of this. Let's go take a look at some graphs, shall we? So let's start with 
a null hypothesis or the basically the assumption that we're going to be looking at some data that doesn't contain any periodicity. So this is some HTTP stuff uh, representing collected data that doesn't have any beacons operating. And this particular graph has been sampled at a sampling period of 10 seconds. Um, this is like, I think like, I just did like three hours worth of data. And you'll see a couple of things that jump out. So the big spike on the left side of there is always going to be present. That is effectively the DC component of the signal or the sum of all the amplitudes of all the signals present in that signal. So you can safely exclude that. That doesn't matter. What you're looking for is the rest of that in, in this uh, little spectrum analyzer here, if anything really jumps out. So there's, there's a couple of pointy things that happen in here. But there's really nothing that's really kind of standing out here. There's really not, no strong frequency spikes that indicate strong signals. So that's good. That's what we're looking for. And I did go back afterwards and deconflict this entire data set to make sure that there was nothing evil in it. So that's good. So instead, let's try this again at a different sampling period. So let's, let's tune the, the analog radio a little bit more and see why, uh, if we can tune in on something else. So this is a different sampling period rather than 10 seconds. I tried it at 60 seconds. And again, there's really nothing that jumps out here either. So that's a good thing. So what I did in practicality here is sample it at like 10 different sampling periods just to see if anything pops out at any of them and none of them did. So that's good. So now let's actually throw a needle into the haystack and go find it. So what I did is I just simply appended onto my initial data set uh, a bunch of timestamps with a callback to a you know, domain I just called periodic.com just so I could find it easily and just appended that to my initial data set <clears throat> and then reapplied this analysis. And now let's see what we get. So our alternative, our alternative hypothesis is that there is something to find and sure enough, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So what I did is made a fake beacon that happens every minute here. And sure enough, there's a strong signal spike now that you see at about 0.167 Hertz, which corresponds to one cycle a second or a beacon interval of one minute. That's exactly what I was supposed to find. What you'll also see here is other strong spikes here. And if you ever played a string instrument or a piano or a guitar or something like that, you'll know a little bit about what harmonics are. And you'll, what you'll find is that you find that things vibrate in integer multiples of their own length, or say that another way in our world here, if something happens every minute, it also happens every two minutes, and also every three minutes, and also every four minutes. So at every even multiple, uh, every, every, every even integer, every, every integer multiple of that original frequency, you'll find a harmonic signal there as well. So let's resample that same data, different sampling period. And I said that there was a, a you know, a, a practical limit on how infrequently you can sample your data. So I'm looking for something that happened every one minute. Well, the minimum amount you can sample that is every 30 seconds. It's still hoping to find anything. Basically one half of the sampling period. So, you know, 30 seconds here, we finally see that spike, but it's on the very edge. So the better sampling period to use here is probably something around 10 seconds if we're out tuning this. Okay. So that's great, but you'll say, wait, hold on a sec here. You just made a contrived example with a jitter that happens metronomically or with a signal that happens every minute. So real adversaries can do something like apply jitter or, or randomness to the signal so that it doesn't happen metronomically. And so this is a, a, a you know, config file here from Cobalt Strike Beacon where you can set a jitter uh, a, as a percent of the, uh, of the timeout time. So what I did, and the reason that adversaries would do this, obviously, is to make the thing look not metronomic, so it's like harder to pick out. Um, it becomes a little bit easier to get lost in the noise. So okay, instead, what I did was I cleaned out all that fake beacon stuff that I that I put in there, and, and this time I, I did the same thing, but added a 10% random jitter. So for a one minute beacon, 10% is up to plus or minus six seconds. So what I did is simply add or subtract a random value up to six seconds to each of those fake beacons. And now let's see what we get. Let's run that analysis again. And guess what? We still got you. So there is a signal there. It's a weaker signal at the frequency of 0 0.167 hertz, or one thing per minute, but it's still there. So that signal is still, you know, it's weaker, but you can still identify that peak in the signal here. So even a relatively strong jitter will still be picked up by this analysis. Okay, so what we've done now is we've actually found the strong signal in all this noise. Let's go isolate that. So what we're gonna do here is get rid of the DC stuff that we didn't care about, find all of our peaks, and basically apply an effective bandpass filter to get rid of everything above that and everything below it. And this is gonna give us just the signal spike that we're looking for after applying that. So what we've effectively done now is denoise the signal. We've gotten rid of everything that we don't care about 
and we're left with only the signal that we're really looking for here. So now what we've got is a signal strength at that frequency. And what that corresponds to back in the real world here is the approximate count of HTTP gets. So there's a couple of knobs you can twiddle in this code to go look for. So what I did is I, I said, you know, give me a strong signal that's anything more than two standard deviations above the mean signal strength present. Um, and then find things, I, I think I said like roughly within 10% of that score. And it'll return a list of domain names. And this is what we're looking for. This effectively now becomes the short list. So what we've now taken a list of domains that might've been in the order of 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh things, and probably return it down to a couple hundred that we care about. In this case, there were only a handful of them. And one of the one was the, my fake beacon, the one I cared about. This becomes your, your final scope of the inquiry for hunting. So this is much more manageable. You can now you go use all of your domain OSINT and hunting skills and tools and try to make some sort of determination of this. Is this relative? Is this good? Is this not good? Is this something that requires a case for incident response? Okay, so that's the how. Let's talk a little bit about some caveats here. So do not try to boil the ocean. If you don't hear anything else out of this, like don't try to go off and do this with six months of HTTP data across your entire organization. That is going to be way too much. And why is that? Um, it's because we're trying to find strong signals and all this noise. And in order to do that, you wanna get rid of as much noise as possible. So a lot of um, unformed, just, you know, freely gotten HTTP data from across your enterprise is probably going to just be a ton of noise. So you want to remove as much of that as you can. So start small. I would actually start by, you know, start with small parts of your enterprise and start with small time frames. And in the real world, you might not get giant spikes like that. So you might be, you know, checking out smaller ones that maybe have a little less fidelity, but it's probably also still worth looking at. And then limit your search. So I would do this only from fairly homogeneous environments that tend to behave the same way. So like as your starting point, pick out like, I don't know, your, uh, your accounts payable people, or maybe like your, your production environment if you're a manufacturing type shop or, or some reasonable segment of your network where things behave kind of similarly. And then limit your search to reasonable timeframes. You might even start with hours, like I said. If you do this for too long, there's just gonna be far too much noise for the signal. And then also, do this where you figure beaconing is probably most likely to occur. So if you know, like you have more vulnerable, you know, uh, parts of your network or user base, that might be a great place to start looking. Okay, so let's wrap this up. I would absolutely love it if someone hit me back up on, you know, on LinkedIn or via email later or something and said, hey, Joe, I, I tried this out and like it totally worked and like I found some interesting stuff that I want you to look at and I tried it across different parts of my network and found some periodic things. I would absolutely love that and I would love it even more if someone was able to take my code and, and take it the next step further and do something else cool with it. So consider this another tool for your hunting toolbox and I'd be really happy to share that with you. Uh, I think this is something that can be used. This is a usable thing. Uh, I think this is practical and, and useful, and I would really absolutely love it if uh, people were able to go and take this and run with it. So thank you very much. It's been great hearing uh, from everyone and being part of this, this uh, threatening summit. Thank you very much. Thanks. That was, that was pretty great. And there are a lot of people in your hallway asking questions. I, I'm going to choose a few of them, but I'll be totally honest. I'm going to leave a bunch of them in the, in the Slack because I'll jump I am not sure. I can communicate them <laughs> very, very well. They're very, very technical. Uh, some of them having to do with Fourier transforms and, and signals and things like that. But there are a few of them that I wanted to talk about. The first one is, um, it's a question in the Slack is, um, would, wouldn't any polling by non-malicious sources also show up in here? And so if so, how do you go about determining if the activity that you identified was malicious or benign? Absolutely, and that is, that is a fantastic question. Just because you found something periodic, that does not mean evil. So you might find you know, uh, things that are like scheduled tasks and at jobs and, and cron things that are, are legitimate business processes. Um, if you work for a cyclical business, you might've just found something that only happens in October, right? So just because you found something that, that is in fact periodic, it's not your job as a hunter to go in and dig in and answer the question like, okay, is this actually evil or not? Uh, and apply any kind of OSINT tech or skills that you've got, uh, apply whatever business knowledge you've got to that, uh, whatever tools you have at your disposal, you're trying to make an up or down decision here to decide whether or not that's evil. Okay, 
Cool. Um, and another question from the Slack is, uh, if you have a, a larger data set, I know you just talked about making sure you don't run it on six months, but you know, if you, if you have a, a relatively larger data set, would your technique for finding jitter, would that make the, the things be harder to detect if it was jitter over a longer period of time, or is it kind of independent of the total amount of time that your data set covers? Yeah, the, the noise is actually coming from the, the number of frequencies present in the signal. So it's, it's more about probably the number of domains rather than the time frame. But again, the smaller and more manageable uh, period of time that you can, you can use this analysis on, you're going to be have a, a much better signal to noise ratio and, and have a much better chance of actually finding things. Would, would that be similar uh, answer if I were to ask you, um, you know, what if you had a period of regular beaconing that did not span the entire data set time frame, like if it started and stopped somewhere in the middle, um, would is I am assuming that would also be more difficult to detect with this, or am I would I be wrong? Now, if you're dealing with a beacon interval that is longer than the data uh, time length that you collected, you wouldn't find it. So pick a reasonable amount of data that would correspond to something that an adversary would probably actually want to deal with. So you know, don't go shorter than maybe a couple hours. Um, in practicality, I mean, beacon activity is going to be on the order of minutes. Okay. I, I was really thinking more like if the beaconing interval was reasonable, but it you know, you had a large set of data and the beaconing both started and stopped. And then there was large types of large parts of your data set where there was no beaconing oh. activity present. Yeah, that, that's that signal will still be present in there, but it will be comparatively weaker. Okay. Well, great. Thank you very much.